1984, Nausicaa, Valley of the Wind. Welcome back to Azart with Nick, John, and Kyle. Today we're going to talk about Nausicaa, Valley of the Wind. It's such a classic. It's fantastic. Originally, it was based off of Miyazaki's manga. We're just going to get into it. We're going to have so much fun. By the way, we're going through all the Miyazaki films from Spirit Away, Princess Mononoke, and Howl's Moving Castle. And we're just going to keep continuing because we're loving this topic so much. All right, guys. Oh, by the way, just as, I just have to say, it's just, this is John's first time watching it. Ooh. Yes. First time watching it. <laughs> fun fact, just to jump into it. He was 44 years old when he directed this movie. Wow. Which I think is really intense for like the start of his career as a director. Yeah. Like that's that's pretty crazy from there to now. Like he's had what, 11 movies now and they're all like top tier, like best animated movies. Like they're um, excellent. Just like, where has this guy been his whole career? It just shows, <laughs> it, it just show it just goes to show you guys that uh, age is only a number. All right. Yeah. Well, it's interesting too that that it also goes to show how long can take to get your break down. Because I'm sure his skill sets did not develop overnight, but maybe that's just how long it took for him to get an opportunity to direct something. I mean, I'm I don't know his background nearly as good as probably the two of you do, but that's that's crazy to think. It's imagine how many great storytellers there are that will never have an opportunity to tell their story that they maybe have or their storytelling. You think of David Fincher and all these, you know, great directors that have a very unique style that you see a film and you're like, oh, this is a David Fincher film. You just know. And there's a lot of them out there that probably will never get to see. So mm -hmm. it's interesting that, like you said, what, 44, you said? Yep. 44. He was born in 1941. Really so he was alive too. Wow. For like the right bombings. in there. Wow. Yeah, that's crazy. And all that stuff, which kind of makes sense. Even with this movie, we see a lot of bombs and the war and then like the, the nuclear explosion and yeah. like the seven days of fire. Who knows what he can remember from that age as a kid, but you know, it had to dr dramatically yeah, sure. affect his life from there on. Out. And mm -hmm. then a lot of his movies too covered the very anti-war and bomb mm -hmm. that we just watched hell's moving castle. And he was uh -huh. talking about the bombing all the time and how like it needs to stop and all this stuff like that. So, so much to get into. Mm. Kyle, you have a list of facts sure. and <laughs> fun, fun things that he wants to share with us. So that let me, thanks for Kyle's let list. Let me of dive facts. in my big bag. Well, we were talking about like the um, uh, background and inspirations for like the movie, right? And so like, yes. like uh, Miyazaki. This this uh, Nasca came after he he made his first directorial debut with um, uh, Lupin the Third, Castle of Cagliostro. Right. Awesome so we can kind of see <laughs> a little bit of those influences still apparent in Nausicaa, um, yes. just be especially with character expressions. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and like uh, also I noticed with effects animation, like with explosions, I was reminded of Lupin, like watching an episode of Lupin yes. or something, um, which was really neat. But we still do get something that's a, that's becoming what we're seeing more distinctly Miyazaki. Right. Um, yes. And then uh, it's interesting because before Nausicaa, um, uh, Miyazaki was playing around with doing an adaptation of Richard Corbin's uh, uh, Rolf, which is a 1971 graphic novel about an anthropomorphized German shepherd. Um, it, it's it's really violent. It's definitely a graphic novel of the 70s. But Miyazaki, he did his own spin on it, which you would assume to be a very Miyazaki-esque move. Basically, he made it about a princess who had a loyal dog that then through magic changed into this anthropomorphized uh, like wolf man thing that went to rescue her um and he even went so far as to do character like concepts and scene uh like scene explorations uh oh. before he uh he abandoned the project because one uh richard corbin did not uh give him the rights to the film so uh -huh. there's that um but yeah um and the nausicaa is actually uh, uh named after um uh a character from home uh from one of the characters in homer's odyssey actually uh, oh. Nausicaa in Greek means burner of ships, um, and she is she is a character that meets Odysseus uh, when he's stranded on one of their islands, um, and she's the only one that isn't afraid to speak to him. Right? Mm. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of cool ties with history and stuff in this movie too. I feel like, yeah, like, and I also kind of I got Dune vibes in this movie mm -hmm. too, like the oasis, like not oasis, but like the the desert landscape and these like giant like creatures that are like guiding you and i don't know if she had any whiffs of salt like they do in dune but <laughs> but it was Bikes pretty cool like the whole, the, the whole 
<laughs> spice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but the whole like connection she had to the bugs kind of just reminds me of like the worms and Dune and stuff like that. And it's yeah. just, and it's super cool too. Cause like I, I was a fan of the designs of the bugs in this movie big time. And I really like the scale and the scope of this animated movie. Like even Disney, I don't know if they ever do scale and scope, especially in the eighties, yeah. like, like, like this, like it's so epic, this film. And it's, it, it looks incredible. It really is there. I actually, uh, I actually froze some of the frames, uh, just cause I'm like that composition. And just that, that scene looks <laughs> epic. Like, especially when they're evacuating the Valley of the wind, like, the, I don't know, like there are some dudes on the hilltop and these throngs mm-hmm. of people are like escaping the, like the explosions and stuff. And then like, uh, on the credits uh, sequence uh, where it shows, um, I think Nausicaa and the princess from Tomakia, um, mm-hmm. like walking to the big, like, like Tomakian ships. And some of them are flying in the background and like, people are like loading up to like lift off. And like, that is, it's just really cool. Sweeping yeah. scenes like that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really cool too. I think I, I see a lot of Miyazaki in this movie, obviously, cause it's Miyazaki, but I love how, in every Miyazaki movie, you have like this violence and this intense warfare, but you have just as much beauty to match it. So it's almost it's like it's like a good balance. Like you can have like this crazy dramatic scene, but then you have like this beautiful nature scene, too. And it like balances like it out. So it's not like you're being drained the whole time. And I know he calls it Ma. It's like the moments between a clap. You know, it's like the action that happens, you know, like that little quiet moment before action, you know, mm-hmm. happens kind of thing. And it's like it gives you a chance to breathe and take it in. It's cool because you even see it in his early filmmaking days. Like he uses these moments to like breathe and relax mm-hmm. before jumping into a major action sequence. Yeah. Like which I just that. Sorry. That's typically how you how you want to pace out action and horror or anything, right? You always want to give those spaces. Tell that to the Transformer I, movies. <laughs> that's an example of what you don't want to do. That's the perfect example of that's like, yeah, like you want an example of how you don't want to do it. Yeah, it's exactly or the movie Crank, where you know it's just like, yeah, it just keeps on going. But yeah, I mean that's I, I, I think the way he voiced that, the way you, you kind of paraphrase it is is a much more elegant way of wording it. But yeah, I mean that's that's just good pacing for storytelling for sure. And it definitely especially this being my first time watching, I definitely appreciated that. And like you said, it, it if you got all if it was always out of nature in the valley, maybe even that would have gotten stale after a while, but jumping back and forth and things like that, like you were saying, it really keeps things fresh. And so everything hits every time you go back and forth because it's always fresh. You're like, Oh, here's this contrasting environment. And you like Mm -hmm. Nick, you mentioning about the, about like the balance between the violence and like the like peace, more peaceful stuff. Like actually a lot of, I've noticed a lot of Miyazaki's themes uh, refer to like, they have an environmentalist edge as well, aside from Mm -hmm. his war stuff. But not just environmentalism, but like a balance between nature and the human world, right? So that's true. Like, I mean, he loves airplanes. <laughs> he loves airplanes, and it's so interesting because, like, you can have the beautiful airplane, like her glider, right? Yep. It's like the fun of flying and the joy, but then you have the warships, yeah, which is like terror and darkness, and it brings discussion. Yeah, you, know, you know what I mean? Like, it brings you know bombs and fire and wherever it goes, but then you have the beauty of just flying and being free, mm-hmm. and it's so interesting because you can tell he loves flying so much, but he's like. There's a bad side to it, you know, because of the war aspect, but there's also a beauty to it where it's like the freedom of flying and the and all that stuff. And it's so right. cool because you see that in all of his movies, even like, you know, Porco Rosso and other films we get into that are very heavy flying. You still get the magical moments, but then you have the violent moments with the destruction of planes and landscapes and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, I interrupted your thought. Kyle. No, 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 no. That's a, that is a great <laughs> observation. Actually, to build on that, I was, it was a scene where Nausicaa is, fl- it's one of the first ones where she's going to uh, intercept Lord Yupa being chased by the Ohm. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like seeing, like not understanding the full mechanics of these of these flying glider <laughs> things that she's riding. Like, I'm just like, that that takes some, some cojones because she's just leaning into it and just going, yes. she's got to have a great sense of like how to, how to maneuver that thing. Because I'm like, man, I'd be pissing my pants. But... Yeah, I know. And I think her head's like even in front of the, the <laughs> air, aircraft. So if she crashes, her head's like the first yep. thing that's going to hit something. <laughs> no, she she is the craft. She's an extension of the craft. <laughs> but that whole opening sequence is beautiful. Like even like seeing yep. the remains of the it, uh, Kyle mentioned going, you know, Kyle, you could you could talk about the whole opening sequence because I loved what you're describing the whole Wally aspect. To oh, it yeah. yeah. Like so one thing that I noticed now, 
Now, I didn't get a chance to test this out myself, but I'm, I have a theory, okay? And, and, and I might task this to some of our w watchers out there tuning in. So the opening sequence where we're first introduced to Nausicaa, and she is in the toxic jungle, and she, she discovers the, uh, the dead Ohm carapace, right? Up until the point to where she uh, is like going up to Lord, like going to save Lord Yupa. Um, that whole scene could have been done without her uh, her voice. Um, I think that the animation and the character acting and the cine uh, cinematography uh, would have been able to tell us the story itself rather than hearing her voiceover. Mm -hmm. um, and I would be curious if anyone were to watch it without sound or dialogue, or if there's a version out there without dialogue for that scene, um, that might be able to support my theory. Yeah, it would still be good to be able to watch it, like you said, with the overall sound mix and yep. the music, but just not the dialogue, because yeah. that still carries a lot of yes. what you're yes. wanting to get out of it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And isn't this a trip that this was based off of manga he was working on? Yeah. Like, I think that's so cool. Like, he, it's it just, talk about being a creator, right? Like, even, even before he even had a chance to direct, he started writing this manga. And, like, the idea of, like, you could create something and have a chance to put it on screen. That's just so cool. Like, it must have been such an awesome moment. I I think he even said, too, they wanted to adapt it even before he had a chance to direct it. But he's like, no one else is directing this but me. <laughs> this is my property. Get your hands off of it. It's like, <laughs> I just think he's so cool. He's such... He's such a badass. Like, you know, he does so much. He has so much control over it. And it's just, it's so cool. Like, it's his it's his creation and property. And you can't blame anyone else if you don't like it. It's his, you know what I mean? Like, it's, he takes all the blame and credit. It's also <laughs> interesting from a world building perspective. Because, so this is something that's kind of, I found there's, there's several hotly contested debates about the world mm. of Nausicaa, right? So there is a map in, in, in the manga um, that shows kind of the region where this stuff takes place. So you see where Pegite is, you see where the Tomakian Empire is, you see where the Valley of the Wind is and stuff. Mm. Also different geographical landmarks. And uh, basically the debates are, is that this is our planet Earth about 2000 years from now, right? Um, or yeah, like around the year 4000, maybe 3800 to 4000. So because in the manga it says that the the seven days of fire, the great disaster, the great war that happened, happened 1,000 years after the industrial the start of the Industrial Revolution, which in historical terms is about 1750 or eight, to 1850 around that time when it got started. So tack on 1,000 years, it's like tw the year 2800 or something, right? But the story of Nausicaa doesn't happen until 1,000 years after that. So we're mm. around the year like mm. 3,800 to 4,000, right? Mm. So it's, it's, it's this really cool post-apocalyptic vibe. And you'll notice the compass rose at the top of the map is flipped. So uh, <laughs> south is north and north is south. It's right? like you're in the upside down. Exactly. Anymore. And also, so that leaves people to believe that the map we're seeing is also flipped. So they believe that the Caspian Sea, this takes place in the Balkans and like the middle of like the Caspian Sea and Mediterranean. So they Always have reason flipped. to believe that that this is like um, in the like in the region between the Balkans and the uh, Middle East and stuff like that. So kind of like uh, between the Caspian and Mediterranean Sea, but those seas are flipped. So the Mediterranean is on the right side of the map and the Caspian Sea is on the left. Right. Mm. So and of course, the geography looks a little bit different because of all of the environmental stuff happening and like terraforming yeah. stuff. And and the great. trees clean the water. Exactly. The forest cleaning the water. Exactly. Which so. is very, very cool. I, I like that idea, too. Like the whole idea how like the forest is like, you know, the earth is going to heal itself kind of thing. It's mm. finding a way to rebalance itself. It's, it's just it's yeah, I I'm a fan. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a fun idea because it's we're getting and you know it's always nice when a movie does this some movies to great great effect will give the audience information that the characters don't have and you have this information and you you get to watch them trying mm. to come to this information that you already have i think more often than not i prefer and i think audiences prefer that we are learning this information along with the characters and when mm -hmm. they come to this realization that oh the you know the the forest is yeah, it's toxic forest, but it is cleaning the environment. It is cleaning things out. When you come to that realization, it's like a cool story beat that I'm glad they didn't give us that information ahead of time. Well, one, yeah, one little thing that I thought was fun about this is if you guys have been around this 
this channel for any length of time, you know that I'm a huge fan of the relatively low budget but influential film, the made for TV Hobbit. And this was made by a bunch of people that would eventually form Studio Ghibli. And the cool thing about this is, is that some of these sound, this is right around the time, not many years after we got the, the, TV Hobbit film and some of these sound effects are directly from that show. So like mm -hmm. when, when they're putting, especially when they're doing a knife, like and when she's uh, uh, trying to cut a yeah. hole in that, like the cling, 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 like that is exactly <laughs> from the swords and everything slashing. That's how big of a nerd I am for that animated film. It's like, yeah. Oh, it's cool. Like I'm getting to see that bridging that gap going from, you know, the Hobbit to this and then, you know, forming into the, the greater like studio. Like it was just, just kind of cool to kind of get to mm -hmm. hear that and see that. And obviously that's not necessarily, Miyazaki, but that's like, you know, whoever else sound libraries traveling around stuff like that. But yeah. it's kind of cool to just kind of hear and see that progression. It's kind of, this is the closest of the Miyazaki films we've seen that has resembled more, most closely to, uh, to that, which has been kind of fun since I know that that studio that worked on that Hobbit film would eventually kind of morph into yeah. Studio Ghibli. So, like, so it's kind of fun in that regard. 1977 is when that Hobbit movie came out. Yeah, yes. Crazy. Yeah. So a number of years later, um, but yeah, and of course, all these years until we started watching these films, I didn't know that a number of people that worked on that would eventually kind of branch off and form Studio Ghibli, but it's kind of cool to, to hear that kind of heritage, I guess. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was just kind of fun seeing those parallels a little bit. What did you guys think of the of the music? I know we always talk about the music, and I yeah. know John's a, John's a music <laughs> fanatic. So, I will say that the... The music was it like it was there was a lot of synth I noticed in certain mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. but that wasn't it wasn't too bad. Like, I mean, no. like no, it was no, used to a pretty good effect, especially like the most memorable one for me is where they're sort of seeing um, the wind dies down in the desert and you kind of mm. see the the dusk horizon line across the desert. And, and like then, then the the like synth chimes <laughs> no. start to come in and I'm yes. like, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's that's definitely <laughs> that's definite desert vibes. You yes. know? Yeah. You know. Certain certain eighties synth soundtracks and scores definitely do not age very well over time because they relied on it a little bit too much. But then there's some, mm -hmm. and this is a very good hybrid. You get very much orchestral, like traditional sounding mm -hmm. sections, mm -hmm. and then yeah. you get sections that do have that synth. Mm -hmm. And I would say, you know, Blade Runner is a good example too. They have very synth sounding sections. But then they have some more regular orchestral stuff in there as well. And, of course, there's many other examples. But this, I felt, was like a good mixture of everything to where, yeah, when you heard it, you're like, ooh, that's 80s. But it's never so much so that you're like, wow, that's really dated itself. It's just like yeah. a fun little, like, cool, this is like a period of time where that was popular. But it still doesn't detract from us watching it way later on. It actually adds to it. You know, it's kind of, kind of fun. So I, I, I completely enjoyed the music for sure. Nice. Guys, we're yeah. going to stop the conversation here and we're going to continue on the podcast. We have a lot to talk about, like the lead character and all the American voice actors that are in this too, which <laughs> Disney produced and stuff like that. And just awesome animation timing and breakdown and stuff like that. And character design. We're going to go deep into a Miyazaki movie. Come join us on the podcast. We are on Apple and Spotify. Look for the As Art Podcast. All right, guys. Thank you very much for watching like Nick was saying, check out the podcast and continue this conversation. If you want to see some really cool artwork, check out Kyle on Instagram. That's Picos with a zero. Check out azart.space for all the audio and video links, and we'll see you on the next Azart. Come be a zombie.